Life isn't fair, neither is the wind direction. For that reason, we've decided to throw together a video discussing crosswind landings tailored to RC airplanes. Before cross-controlling into this video, we strongly suggest watching our rudder use and flying in wind videos as some required prerequisite information. Let's side slip right into it. Crosswind takeoffs. The big picture concepts of taking off in a crosswind are the same as any other takeoff, but the main difference lies in those pesky ailerons and using your rudder a bit more than you're used to. Remember adverse yaw that we've discussed in our older rudder videos? If not, be sure to take a peek. When taking off with a crosswind, it's necessary to position your ailerons into the wind. This input should be given before you even begin your takeoff roll by doing a quick check of the windsock. By doing this, you are not only preventing the lifting force of the crosswind from raising the upwind wing, but also aiding and adding yaw input via the ailerons through adverse yaw. Keeping your ailerons into the wind can be the difference between a ground loop and a successful takeoff. Into the wind, not touching the rudder, against the wind. Let's start our crosswind takeoff. Make sure the ailerons are fully positioned into the wind and apply your preferred takeoff thrust while dancing on your rudder, giving the required inputs to maintain centerline. Using ailerons with opposite rudder is referred to as cross control. As your airspeed increases, so too will the effectiveness of your flight controls. Don't leave your ailerons at full deflection the entire takeoff roll, or you'll roll into the ground after rotating faster than Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> The amount of cross control required will also decrease as the aerodynamic effectiveness of your control surfaces increases with higher air speeds. When compensating for the crosswind with your rudder to maintain center line, find the rough amount of rudder you need to maintain the center line and consider that amount as your new neutral point. Adjust from there. If you adjust from dead neutral, you'll end up in a pilot induced oscillation and make your life harder than it needs to be. Once you're ready to fly and hopefully on center line, rotate as any other takeoff would, but keep a bit of that aileron input into the wind through the rotation. From there, adjust inputs as needed to allow the nose to crab into the wind as discussed in our rudder video. This will ensure you'll maintain your desired ground track over the runway centerline. If you don't, you'll get blown away from the runway in no time and wonder why you flew into the trees next to you. Before we continue, you've probably noticed we are using vague terms quantifying how much control input is necessary in these different scenarios. Well, everything is dependent on wind conditions, aircraft characteristics, and feel. It's not quite rocket science, but this does require some trial and error to figure out. Let's briefly discuss the differences between tailwheel and tricycle gear takeoffs in a crosswind. For tricycle gear aircraft, use the aforementioned procedures. For tailwheels, there are two different procedures to optionally use. For a tailwheel taking off in a three-point or tail-low attitude, relieve your back pressure to rotate as opposed to adding it with a trike. For a tail-up crosswind tailwheel takeoff, the same procedures apply as a trike except first raising the tail and maintaining that forward pressure before rotating. See our tailwheel takeoffs video for an in-depth explanation on both tail low and tail up tailwheel takeoffs in calm winds. That's a lot of tailwheels. Now, onto the common errors with crosswind takeoffs. First up, not holding the cross control input of ailerons into the wind on the takeoff roll. This leads to the plane becoming at the mercy of the wind and getting blown off course and or rolling with the wind upon rotation. It also generally leads to being mercilessly bounced across the runway from the wind before rotating and inducing undue stress to the gear from the side loading that bouncing on the downwind wheel causes. The opposite version of this error would be holding full aileron through the entire takeoff roll into the rotation. This would lead to an abrupt roll into the wind on rotation and potentially a wingtip strike. As previously mentioned, be sure to use the amount of aileron needed based on your given airspeed. This is entirely scenario based and the more planes you fly and practice this with, the more it'll become second nature. Another common failure is not maintaining centerline due to a combination of incorrect rudder inputs and or the ailerons. Strive to make the smallest possible adjustments which are proportional to the aircraft's deviations as a dance with your feet or left or right thumb, depending on if you're mode one or two. Finally, if it's super windy and gusty now, be sure to wait a little longer to rotate to ensure that you've got ample control authority to not get blown off the runway as well. That's it for takeoffs. Now onto the fun part, crosswind landings. They're a necessary evil that's important to know how to defeat rather than deferring to letting our lord and savior Bob Hoover take the wheel. Bob Hoover. Take the wheel. There are two optional procedures for crosswind landings. A side slip, aka wing low touchdown, or a crabbed approach followed by a decrab to touchdown. Crabbing is the easiest to start with, but still requires precise timing to decrab the round out and flare. We'll start off with the crab approach ending with a decrab to touchdown. When would you want to use this procedure? For most planes, this is the best bet on a day with a steady lower velocity crosswind and or when planning to land short. For this example, let's start on final approach in an established crab. This means that our nose is pointed into the wind, but our airplane is tracking over the ground parallel to the centerline of the runway. As discussed in our rudder video, not crabbing is like trying to point your rowboat directly at the opposite shore of the river with a strong current and expecting your boat to reach the shore on the side directly across from you. 
This simply won't happen, and the same concept applies should you point your nose straight down a runway with a crosswind and expect to continue to go where you're pointed. A proper crab requires pointing your boat, or plane, into the wind just enough to keep the plane traveling, or tracking, over the ground the way you want it to without running off the side of the runway. While on final, you'll make small corrections while staying coordinated using aileron paired with rudder. Do this as needed to adjust your heading to keep the plane pointed into the wind in order to maintain your runway's ground track until just prior to touchdown. Then, after you round out and you're ready to flare to touchdown, use your rudder combined with some quick aileron cross control to gently decrab the airplane to align its nose and wheels with the runway so you don't land in a Tokyo drift configuration and damage your landing gear. Doing this too early or too late could mean you smack the plane into the runway under a large side load, which, as we've said before, isn't the best for your gear. As with crosswind takeoffs, progressively increase aileron deflection into the wind throughout the entire rollout until you're at full deflection at a lower airspeed. Crabbing in trikes versus tailwheels. For trikes, use the aforementioned procedure. For tailwheels, only use this procedure if you're planning to land in a three-point or full stall configuration. Let's move on to the most difficult, but also the most fun crosswind landing procedure, the side slip or wing low touchdown. Here's a brief summary of it before we get into a sample scenario. Think of a side slip as rubbing your stomach, patting your head, and winning a 1v1 in rust all at the same time. For real though, it's the act of using cross control with aileron and rudder to allow yourself to land on one tire, the upwind tire, with the tire rolling parallel to the runway center line. When and how would you want to use the side slip or wing low method? These are best used on overall windier and gusty days. Knowing this, it's arguably safer to fly an approach to a side slip with a higher than normal approach speed to ensure you've got ample control authority to fight these winds throughout the entire landing process. A quick couple side notes. In full scale, it's suggested to use less or no flaps on a gusty crosswind approach should you need to go around for a couple reasons. The first reason being is to ensure the least aerodynamic drag is present when performance is needed, and the second reason is having flaps up is conducive to a faster approach and ensures more stability. Since we tend to have gobs of excess thrust in RC planes, it's dealer's choice on flaps. As a final side note, remember that some planes won't allow the safe use of the side slip or wing low method due to landing gear geometry, like in some airliners, as an example. So how and when do you enter a side slip? You can begin your side slip on a mile final or right before you flare whatever floats your boat. If you're a beginner, we'd suggest starting it early for the practice. For the sake of this example, let's start the side slip in the roundout as we are about to begin our flare. As you begin your roundout and prep to flare, begin to add opposite rudder to remove your crab and align the nose with the runway center line. At this point, if you only were to use your rudder to point the nose down the runway without opposite aileron, you would begin to drift with the wind. To counteract this, vary the amount of aileron input into the wind as needed. This is complicated to think about, but use ailerons opposite of your rudder input to adjust. You can adjust your ground track left or right by varying the cross control aileron input depending on what the wind is doing throughout your landing process. It's crucial to keep your upwind wing down and into the wind during this entire process as well to prevent side lows on the gear when you're ready to touch down. On to the touchdown in a side slip. This is by far the most crucial part of the crosswind landing and the part that most people mess up. The plane is not done flying until it's parked. As you continue your side slip inputs into the roundout, begin your flare and gently set down your up and wheel onto the runway. Keep your ailerons into the wind and dance on that rudder to maintain your center line. As you slow, the gradual loss of aileron effect in this from reduced airspeed will result in your downwind wheel, the one still off the ground, gently setting onto the runway. Add more and more aileron as your airspeed decreases until you're at full deflection by the time you're at a snail's pace. An airplane rolling down the runway with a crosswind is like a windsock. It wants to point into the wind or weather vane. Finally, as you slow, be sure to dance on your rudder, maintain your center line, and keep your ailerons into the wind until you've come to a complete stop. As with climbing a tree, don't get too comfy or you'll fall out. As we've noted before, keeping your ailerons into the wind throughout the entire landing process does induce yaw to fight the crosswind via adverse yaw. So doing so can mean the difference once again between a clean landing and a ground loop. Tailwheels versus trikes and side slopes. With the tricycle gear, perform everything as previously noted, allowing the nose wheel to settle onto the runway as you slow and keep those ailerons into the wind. With a tail wheel, side slip touchdowns work best entered from a wheel landing. Perform everything as previously mentioned, except remember to apply forward pressure to keep the upwind tire and then both tires planted while also simultaneously maintaining your cross control inputs. It's a lot, we know. As you decelerate, allow the tail to settle onto the ground and then bring your stick back to keep the tail wheel planted to ensure proper mechanical steering authority. For those wondering, yes, you can also land a tail wheel in a side slip via a three point. This would have you touching down the upwind wheel and the tail wheel at the same time and then setting down the downwind wheel. 
User beware though, because some folks would argue that if you were to get a gust, there's a higher risk of a ground loop due to less effectiveness of your flight controls at your lower airspeed. Finally, let's look at the common errors associated with crosswind landings as a whole. First up, trying a landing that's well outside of the planes or your own limits. Don't bite off more than you can chew. Work your way up to inhaling a Big Mac in one bite. Another one is freezing up in the round out and forgetting to line up the airplane with the runway via either a decrab or side slip. This can lead to that excessive side loading on the gear, so be careful. As we've mentioned numerous times, aileron into the wind is truly what makes or breaks a good crosswind landing. Not doing this can lead to the potential loss of directional control. No one wants that. Remember though, the more aileron cross control into the wind that you give, the more opposite rudder you'll need, and vice versa. If you run out of rudder, it's too windy. Plain and simple. Land with less crosswind, or cheat, and land across the runway. Since, you know, we can do that as RC pilots, depending on the flying site. Let's wrap things up with some big picture pointers to help you gain long-term success with your crosswind takeoffs and landings. First up, always remember this. Your touchdown in a crosswind doesn't have to be 110% perfect. A smooth landing isn't necessarily a textbook landing. Your wheel can be slightly crooked, despite what armchair instructors will tell you. Just be sure to not be too crooked to avoid that heavy side load, and to always be working towards getting them to as close as perfect as you can. This will come with time. Next up, a great practice technique on a calm or even windy day is to go down the entire runway in a side slip, both keeping one tire an inch above the runway and optionally touching it as well. Doing this while maintaining centerline in a touch and go pattern will build your confidence and stick and rudder skills much quicker. This is essentially just practicing one wheel landings and it's our favorite maneuver by far. For added fun, try doing these in a large open field that's big enough to approach from in all directions. Start doing takeoffs and landings into the wind, and then gradually change the angle of your runway to come in with more and more of a crosswind to build confidence. Fly the takeoffs and approaches towards you and away from you if possible. The third suggestion we've got is to not over control on approach. It's easy to want to give huge inputs when the nerves are up, but remember this. One big input to the right, followed by another equally big input to the left, is a level plane field. Add five, subtract five, it equals zero. Don't let the plane fly you. Our fourth suggestion is to try your crosswind takeoffs with reduced power. With RC planes, we have so much excess thrust that we can essentially cheat and power out of a crosswind takeoff vertically. If you force yourself to limit your thrust to 50% or less, for example, it keeps you more on top of your stick and rudder work and makes a takeoff look scale too, if that floats your boat. You can see some examples of this in videos where we fly our giant scale P47. As we said before, life isn't fair, but now hopefully you've got tools to make an unfair wind into a no-brainer. What's your favorite crosswind landing procedure? If you've enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe for more. Happy landings and bounce one on for us. We'll see you next time with a new upload. Ooh. <laughs>